degrees below <laughs> zero, the atmospheric pressure is so low, we can go on and on. Yeah, but the leap then from life to intelligent life, mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about that. Mm. What, is that just so extraordinarily large that, I mean, a, sci a good scientist doesn't go there? There are two tracks for that. Mm -hmm. The first track is, here we are on this planet, uh, we've come up here after a long development period of four and a half billion years, and there is this sentient life form, this quote-unquote intelligent life form that exists on this planet. We look around the rest of the universe, and as we mentioned earlier, 50 billion galaxies, 300 billion stars per galaxy. If each one of those has a planet, well, we can't even, it's hard to even say what the number of planets would be. It would be arrogant of us, in one sense, to say that there's no intelligent life in any of these other places. Completely arrogant, just because of the numbers alone. So if we look at the probability, the probability says that there is some form of intelligent life out there, the probability. However, let's look at how life developed on this planet. Is it possible that a process like this could be repeated? and come up with the same result? Ooh, that really changes what your outlook is. And then when you also consider the fact that we have not had any kind of contact or proof whatsoever of any other kind of intelligent life, that also makes it a pretty daunting argument to say that there is. However, we have to go back to the probability. Billions of galaxies, billions of stars, hundreds of billions, billions of billions of planets got to be the case. But the universe is so vast, on the other hand, we may never have any contact. That's the show I was going to say, given that size, then how could one ever have the possibility of finding how it? How could one ever yeah. have that possibility? Yeah. But it's not to say that we should stop looking or that we should close our minds to the possibility yeah. that we should stop searching. We should do this because the, that there's that ever so slight chance that we could get the message today. Men and women in space, tell us what you think the next, what's the next revolution there? What's, what can we look forward to in the next few decades in terms of that? I think the big change that's going to come in the next few decades about people in space is, uh, works like this. In my mind, I see that the national space organizations of the industrialized nations around the world are going to take on the work of doing the big research, the big exploration, sending people to the moon to establish colonies, sending people to Mars to do all the research there, and on throughout the solar system. On the other hand, though, I see that there is a developing commercial access to space that's coming from people who simply have enough money to build their own rockets to get to space. I mean, we live in an era now where there are people whose childhood dream was to be able to go into space, but at the same time in this era, they now have the money to build their own systems to do that, and that's one of the things that's happening. So I think we'll begin to see that some of the more mundane space, uh, ac space access issues, like shuttling astronauts up to International Space Station or delivering food or water or things like that, are going to be done by some of these non-governmental agencies, these uh, sort of commercial uh, aspects. It'll be like uh, UPS or FedEx with just another zip code to deliver to. It happens to be 200 miles up in space. And I also think that we will eventually return to the moon and start to develop our capability to spend some time there I wonder if we will have the wherewithal to extend that out to Mars, but I certainly think that the moon is going to be a realized target sometime in the next 20 to 40 years. Now, do you think this will become a kind of a vacation destination for the super rich? Will there be that <laughs> as well? I mean, when you talk about these billionaires, mm -hmm. which we do have that are doing things that they want to do, mm -hmm. um, I, I suddenly had this image of, you know, their... You know, people go up to up Mount Everest, they'll be going to the moon. I think yeah. low Earth orbit is certainly going to be one of those things that's easily attainable in the next several decades. Going to the moon will, I, could possibly also become that, but it's a much more daunting challenge. That's a much more serious effort. We do have to remember that the space environment is a, an incredibly nasty environment. <laughs> 
you yeah. know, there's, there's, there's no forgiveness for making a mistake in space. Yeah. There just isn't. And, you know, we common people are not used to all the kinds of precautions. I mean, we hear a little bit about the precautions that the national space agencies take to protect their astronauts, but, oh my gosh, it is an incredibly nasty environment. One small slip and you're done for. So the challenge of that will allow us to get back to low Earth orbit, but for people with the wherewithal to do so going to the moon, that'll be a much bigger challenge. Um, it's often said that when people come to a field from um, another perspective or from a marginal group within the mainstream, they see things freshly or with uh, more originality. And I wonder if, as an African American, you yourself mentioned that when you went into the field, you couldn't even conceive realistically about being an astronaut, and yet you did pursue this field to the point where you're now a major spokesman in the area, you're a researcher, you're knowledgeable. Do you feel you bring a perspective that's unique, given your background, that, that is, uh, has been helpful both to you and to the field? I think so. The one that uh, comes to mind most immediately is the fact that science is accessible to everyone. Mm. Astronomy in particular, it's the field that I work in, one might say that I would point at this one and say this one of course is, is most easily accessible to everyone. Not true, uh, it's the one that I dabble in, uh, but one of the things I see that coming from my point of view is that the world that we have today is built by everyone in it, and the contributions to science have come from every culture. The denial of any particular culture's participation in any science is cutting off a possible resource for advancement in that science. My purpose in doing the public stuff that I do, if you will, is to make sure that people understand that this is what we have to do so that we all can advance. So the accessibility issue uh, for me comes that or points to the fact that everyone should have access. Everyone can have access. Everyone thinks about these things. Everyone invents, creates, uh, provides in these fields. And so we all need to recognize that inclusion is probably the greatest diversity we can have across every aspect of our lives and existence here. So do you think of yourself as kind of a promoter, a popularizer? Do you go into the schools, for example, and talk to, to students from all backgrounds and try and get them excited about astronomy? Is that, do you consider that one of your goals as chief astronomer at the Franklin Institute? I'm, I'm trying to figure out what, how you spend your day, for example. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a different subject yeah. entirely. Uh -huh. uh, but yes, I do go into schools and I do talk to kids about, mm -hmm. about allowing their interest in science to flourish. Mm -hmm. Very often, kids want to squash that interest in science because someone tells them it's too difficult or that's not the way to go because you, weren't, or you won't earn a good living right. or only nerds do that sort of thing. And my point is that what could be more exciting? What could be more interesting? What could be more fulfilling? What could be more empowering than to understand how the world works on a scientific level? A very simple example. If I can understand the physics of how something in this room works, I can understand the physics of how something works over on the opposite end of the universe without ever having to go there. What's more powerful than that? Someone would say, a lot of money. Well, sure, but I could lose that money in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. If the stock market crashes, that's gone. But the knowledge that I have, that I can apply to some phenomenon across the other side of the universe, and I can even think about or figure out how it works for the first time ever, what's more empowering than that? So that's one aspect of it. And then I had another thing happen to me. It goes along that same line. About uh, six or eight years ago or so, I decided I was going to stop doing public television stuff because I felt I had done plenty, enough, and I decided to give it up. About three weeks later, a grandmother stopped me on the street and said, when my four-year-old son, grandson sees you on television, he stops what he's doing and focuses on what you're saying. And when you're done, he goes back to what he's doing. And to me, that was a message that here's an image that's created for kids that means something to them. And I, that's something that I ought to allow to happen. 
for kids to see that there's something that they can do if they interpret it that way. That's a wonderful story. Well, as we're uh, closing here, I wonder if you could just speak briefly about what you think will be the greatest breakthrough in the next decade uh, in space. Is there any one thing that you see as uh, particularly exciting or important that's looming on the horizon? There are two great breakthroughs that are going to happen coming up in the near future. One is the discovery of life somewhere else in the solar system, either current or past. The other one is finally coming to understand dark matter and dark energy. These two concepts, this phenomenon of dark matter, dark energy, is an incredibly fundamentally important discipline to understand because it governs the fate of our universe. It also uh, helps us to define very clearly where we, humans, all the matter that we see as real matter, rank in importance in everything else in the universe. So it can completely change our understanding of who we are, where we are, how important we are, as well as understanding how the universe is going to function in the future. Fascinating. It's not only technical, it's philosophical. Absolutely. Then. Well, in terms of popular science or science fiction, do you have something in particular that you like, um, whether it's a movie or a comic book or a book that you, that you would want to discuss or talk about with us? Well, I have to admit, I am a big fan of science fiction writing. Mm. But I'm a fan of the science fiction writing of the 60s and 70s, not so much the fantasy stuff. And I like the science fiction writing of the 60s and 70s because it pulls in all these different aspects that I really enjoy. The astronomy, the exploration of the universe, the technology of how you get around. My favorite, though, happens to be Isaac Asimov's Foundation Trilogy uh -huh. because he wraps all of that stuff up in a really compelling story. And, of course, if you don't have a great story, the rest of it really doesn't matter. I have to matter. tell you, that's my father's favorite, too. Ah, I, have it, I have a mm -hmm. whole box set at mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I really want to thank you, Derek Pitts, for joining us today. Thank this you. This has my been pleasure. a great interview. And I want to thank you for joining us at the Drexel Interview.